Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Vaughn with Family Fiction's Christian Fiction Bookshelf Podcast. On today's episode of the Christian Fiction Bookshelf Podcast, I have Kimberly Woodhouse here to talk to us about her latest book called The Gem of Truth. Hi, Kimberly. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for coming and being on the Christian Fiction Bookshelf podcast. That's a tongue tie- twister, but we're so excited to have you here. I would love for you to share with our viewers a little bit about the book. Who I'm very excited about this one. This is book two in my Secrets of the Canyon series from Bethany House. Mm-hmm. And this is actually the one that was the first story that came to mind when I was doing research in the Grand Canyon back in 2008 because I saw a historical placard that talked about the Spanish exploration that came in 1540 and, you know, rediscovered um, the Canyon, you know, for modern times. Mm -hmm. And so my brain just went spinning and I had so much fun with it. And I made up a legend, you know, that goes along with these Spanish explorers in 1540. And so there's a legend and there's treasure and there's a mystery and, you know, all kinds of stuff that, that happens with it. So I'm really excited about this story. The heroine, is a storyteller. In other words, she's a liar. <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of my favorite part of, of her because, you know, we've all had those people in our lives. We've known people or we've been that person ourselves. Right. And she, um, it's how she's dealt with some serious trauma, you know, mm-hmm. that she's had throughout her life. And she comes up with these elaborate stories, but she's never able to really build lasting and deep relationships because nobody ever trusts or believes her, you know, after a while. Right. So there's a huge growing curve for her. And then the hero is a jeweler and that's how they come together is through the treasure. So okay. it's all of the Grand Canyon at the El Tavar and the Harvey girls, lots of cool history. Yeah. So tell us about what a Hardy girl is. Um, a Hardy girl was what Fred Harvey created was brilliant. So they think of him as the modern day creator or the creator of modern day marketing. And he's the creator of the service industry, food service industry, because he's the first person who put all of this together. So he convinced the railroad to allow him to build Harvey houses along the rail line as they built West. Mm -hmm. And so he would staff them with the waitresses, which were Harvey girls. He had very strict guidelines for them. And he served impeccable food. Everything was on time. If they were just traveling through, they would come, they would order their food. They would have this huge course meal, you know, several course meal and get back on the train within 45 minutes. I mean, everything was just impeccable. So one of the things that people will always remember is the fact that when he served dessert, a piece of pie was a quarter of a pie. So his service, everything was just huge and wonderful. So people came to really rely on, you know, good food, good service, good accommodations at the Harvey house. And then the El Tavar was built in the early 1900s and it became the crown jewel of the Harvey empire because it sits right on the rim of the Grand Canyon. It's a, it's an amazing hotel. Is it still there? It's still there. Oh, wow. I've been to the Grand Canyon, but I've not seen that. So cool. Yeah. So what um, was the inspo outside of the Grand Canyon? What ended up being your inspiration for that book? You know, I've always wanted to write a Harvey Girl series. And I think probably inspired by my very dear friend, Tracy Peterson. She wrote a series for Bethany House that was Harvey Girls years and years ago. And I remember loving that, you know, as a reader. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated with the Harvey girl. So I had bought all these books and was studying up on Fred Harvey. And he was just a fascinating man. So everything was just kind of roiling in that. And so then when I went back to the Grand Canyon with my kids, Mm -hmm. of course, they're adults now, but, you know, back in 2008, when we went back, it was so fun to see it through their eyes. And then it just sparked everything. And that all just kind of came together. And I said, oh, we've got to do the Harvey girls at the Grand Canyon. Nice. Yeah. So I've never heard of the Harvey girls. Like how far did they go? Were they just in that area or did he have them all over the country? It was all over um, from the Midwest all the way to the West, all of the Harvey houses. And I can't even remember at the time there were 80 to a hundred Harvey houses along the line. And there was a lot of Harvey girls. So they said that that's actually how the West was settled because the Harvey girls ended up marrying the men. Okay. Makes sense. And that's, families and and everything so yeah. there's a lot of really cool history there's a movie that judy garland was in um called harvey girls oh okay it doesn't have a whole lot of emphasis on the harvey girls yeah. but 
um, <laughs> it, it's pretty cool. People, yeah. people have seen that. Yeah. So what can you tell us about the relationship with Julia and the man she falls in love with? Oh, <laughs> so Chris, Christopher is the hero. Mm-hmm. And he is all about honesty. Mm-hmm. So it's very difficult for him. Obviously, you know, there's some conflict later on in the story when he finds out about Julia's past. Okay. Um, she's been trying to turn over a new leaf and is trying to make sure that she's, you know, honest and not telling any new stories at this new a new place. She's trying to have a fresh start. Um, Chris is just a beautiful, beautiful, I think, example of Christ mm-hmm. and the love and just this un, unconditional love. There's a lot of sacrifice in the story, but it's not just between Chris and Julia. It's between other characters that have been, you know, throughout the series mm-hmm. and uh, Ruth, who is the head waitress. The third book is actually Ruth's book. And that releases in January. That's a mark of grace, but there's a big thread with Ruth um, between Chris and Julia as well. So mm-hmm. there's other characters, you know, from the first book, Emma Grace and Ray that are, that are brought in. Mm-hmm. And it's just a, I love having multiple characters and multiple facets and things like that. There's the Hopi people, which I've used because the native people were a very, very big part of um, this time in history. And especially there at the Elta Bar. Okay. So when somebody gets to that last chapter and they get to that last period and the mm-hmm. end, what do you want them to take away from this book? <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing that I would like people to take away is just God's unconditional love mm-hmm. for them and understanding that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, mm-hmm. he loves you and he's there for you. And you can never do, you know, send your way out of God's love. You can't, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. And so I think the book is a beautiful picture of that and sacrificial love, which is not only um, Christ, but friends, you know, that scripture, a friend will lay down his life mm-hmm. or the greatest thing is the man could lay down his life for his friends. Mm-hmm. And that is a, an example in the book that really hits home with the characters. And it does a lot of life change within the characters and also in book three. So I think that would be the biggest thing is unconditional sacrificial love. I love the fact that the third book is coming out in January, that you don't have to wait a whole year for it. Right. <laughs> you don't have to, people have been begging me for Ruth's story since A Deep Divide first came out. And mm-hmm. I'm very excited to tell them that Ruth's story is coming. In oh, January. good. Good. So what's next for you after Ruth's story comes out? Um, let's see. Ruth's story comes out in January. Then in March, I have a contemporary suspense releasing from Kriegel and that's 26 below. Then in May, um, the next book, the next series that Tracy and I are writing is set in Kalispell. That's called the heart's choice. Then I have another series with Bethany house starting that includes dinosaurs and paleontology. So I'm really excited about that one that comes out in September. And then in November, the second book in the contemporary suspense, Alaska series comes out so when when do you sleep (laughs) (laughs) well (laughs) i'm always on deadline like right now i'm juggling four books you know first i had all these deadlines i was juggling three books you know it's just always in the process making sure i have my brain wrapped around which one at the right time is yeah it's the fun part yeah so i imagine notes are very important yes yeah, well, there's a stack of notebooks somewhere over here. <laughs> it's a big stack of them. If somebody wanted to be a writer and came to you and asked for advice, what would you tell them? I would tell them to study the craft mm-hmm. and to not get discouraged because it takes time. Um, I don't know how many people I've mentored over the years or I critique. You know, we've done those critiquing at conferences right. and stuff like that. And you talk to people and you can always tell when people have the gift of a storyteller. Mm-hmm. And that's something that can't be taught is mm-hmm. having that gift of a storyteller. Right. All the rest of it can be taught. I think um, Jim Bell, James Scott Bell was the first one I heard say that. And it's so true. Mm-hmm. Everything else can be learned. You can learn the craft. You can study the craft. And the craft has changed just since I've been published I guess it's been 13 14 years now but after 30 some odd books you know it's still mm-hmm. it's changing I have to keep learning I have to keep growing so I, I want to tell people not to get discouraged to make sure that you are doing it to the very best of your ability um 
that's my belief. I think that we should do everything to the best of our ability for the glory of the Lord. And so, you know, keep studying, keep learning. Don't get discouraged. There's a lot of people that took, you know, 10 years before they got published, but mm -hmm. they really learned, you know, the craft. And so I just tell people to write. Don't wait for inspiration. Don't wait for, you know, something to happen. For the, those of us who do this, I have a couple of quotes hanging up here. One's, you know, Stephen King. It's like, you have to actually do it. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is just a waiter. They're not a mm -hmm. writer. So yeah, yeah. The discipline is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's great advice. Well, Kimberly, thank you so much for coming by the Christian Fiction Bookshelf podcast and being on our latest chapter. She is published by Bethany House, which is a division of Baker Publishing Group. And please, it's out now. Go to your local Christian bookstore and pick it up. If you don't have one near you, please pick it up wherever you buy your books. And Kimberly cannot wait to see what happens next for you. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thanks.